All right. I think we are live. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta, uh, and I work for Amazon. Now, DevOps is known to have some of the finest speakers in the world and some of the best attendees in the world, just like you people. And hold on. You are the best of the best because you are staying Thursday evening right before food is being served. You know, you're the best of the best audience, you know, the nerdiest and the geekiest of all. Thank you. Um, when we think about machine learning, you know, we always think in terms of machine to machine. But if you go back, you know, everything that our brain has been trained for has been sort of human learning. How you learn how to ride a bike, you know? Somebody says, take a left turn, you take a left turn. Somebody says, take a right turn, you take a right turn. Somebody says, a hill is coming up, you know, your mind recognizes it, you start pedaling harder, or you change your gears. So that's how humans have evolved. Machine learning is nothing but applying those principles between different machines and making it more automated. All the more relevant because now the amount of data that is being generated is very difficult otherwise to process that data. But typically when you talk about machine learning, everybody wanna do machine learning. You know, anybody and everybody is generating lots and lots of data. Machine learning is hard. You know, my CTO says apply machine learning. How do I apply machine learning? On what to what? What do I do out of machine learning? But then customers start thinking, okay, fine, I get the point that this is the data we're gonna get out of it. But in order to understand machine learning, there are so many concepts you need to learn. You know, data scientists, you know, what is a model training, what is a model inference, what kind of algorithms, what kind of GPUs, CPUs, what framework should I choose? Uh, what's a CUDA driver? You know, I'm a Java developer. How do I know all these things? So you're making it really hard, and these things keep changing quite rapidly. So you're literally drinking from a big fire hose right up there. So let me kind of set the context here. What is machine learning? In, in context of machine learning, if you think about it, there is a training data. You know, this training data is what you gather. That okay, I'm, I want to make a, a model by which it will say which I'll feed an image, and that image, it'll be able to tell me what is the facial expression. Is it sad? Is it anger? Is it happy? Is it frowning? That's all I want to do. So you're going to capture a data with a lot of facial expressions of those images. Uh, different color, different ethnicity, different background, different sizes. You try to vary the data so that the model is a lot more real. So you have a training data, you feed it to your training algorithm, you choose a particular algorithm, write a code for that, and you generate a model out of it. And then you have a separate set of test data. You know, training data and test data are meant to be separate. And that test data is what you feed into the model that, okay, the model that I generated, is that accurate? Is that valid? What is the efficiency of the model? What is the optimization of the model? How soon you know, uh, it takes to train the model? That kind of things. Eventually, you get to the inference where you said, okay, I got about 90% accuracy of the model, I'm gonna put it into production, and now I'm gonna give it real data. That anybody can upload an image and say, tell me the facial expression about this, and then I should be able to do the inference. End of the day, machine learning, this is what it boils down to. It boils down to how accurate are your predictions. I'm giving you a face with a smiling expression. Are you able to tell me back that this is a face with a smile expressions? If not, then the loop goes all over again. Oh, you know what? I built the model in US, but now I'm applying the model in Asia. So, oh, I need to have the right training data and test data. So then again, significant part of your machine learning processing goes into the training aspect of it and the data and the cleaning and the ingestion and the tagging and the classification aspect of it. So let's take a quick look at how do, at Amazon, we see machine learning. We really see machine learning as three different layers. There's a bottom layer uh, where you can use any framework, whether it's PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, Apache, MXNet, Picket, and a wide range of compute infrastructure. You know, we got the P2, P3 instances, which are GPU-powered instances. We, we got all sorts of different frameworks, you know, uh, elastic um, uh, Kubernetes service fits over there, which is what we're gonna talk about in the talk. We got uh, Inferentia, we got Elastic Inference, all sorts of compute capability over there. In the middle layer is where we have a managed service. You know, the bottom layer is meant for expert machine learning practitioners um, who can actually set up their infrastructure. Then comes Amazon SageMaker, which is a fully managed service where you say, I don't have the time to set up the infrastructure, manage the infrastructure, provision it, scale it. 
do everything for me. So SageMaker is a fully managed service in that sense if you want to get started with machine learning. At the, bar, at the top layer is where we have what we call as the AI services or the cognitive services. This is where services like recognition, Lex, Poly all come in handy, where you can give a text to it and it'll convert it back into audio for you. Or you can, the way you talk to Alexa, hey Alexa, tell me the NBA scores. And then there is a machine learning model running in the background which is constantly getting updated and you have the latest information for you. So that's all, those are three different layers of uh, machine learning essentially as we see at Amazon, targeted at three different customers. That's sort of a broader stack. Now when you think about machine learning, it's not just about thinking about your frameworks. That's one aspect of machine learning. You also have to think about your storage, your analytics capability. Um, you want to be able to do that high throughput, low latency kind of a storage mechanism over there. You want to be able to store that data. You want to be able to perform that real-time analytics. So all that information is super critical. So if you're thinking about your machine learning stack, running it in the cloud particularly, that's the way to think about it, okay? What we're going to focus on is on the bottom layer of the left side, as I was saying earlier, on a very specific aspect over there. Why machine learning on Kubernetes? So let's talk about that. Uh, why Kubernetes and why machine learning on Kubernetes are very similar reasons in that sense. So portability, scalability, and um, uh, composability. If you think about machine learning, there is a group that is performing the training and the inference, which is typically data scientists. And then there is the ops part of it, typically called as ML ops. And so there are two sides, you know, data scientists do the training and the inference, they write the algorithm, they do the model training, and now you want to take it into production. So those are typically written as independent microservices, and Kubernetes has those concepts where those two microservices or a range of microservices can really compose with each other. So that composability becomes a key. Portability is important because data scientists, if they are manipulating the model on their own local machine, then they want to run it in the cloud and scale it so that portability, Kubernetes provides that layer where it not, does not lock you into a particular cloud you know, or a desktop or a compute environment. You know, it spans across your on-prem, desktop, cloud environments. And scalability, of course, that's what Kubernetes is known for, that um, if your needs grow, it's very well known for those burstable environments, stateless, stateful environments, and that's, those are the typical benefits of why Kubernetes is well suited. Now, let's take a look at how Kubernetes looks like without Kubeflow, for example, okay? Um, if you're doing your training on laptop or on your on-prem cluster or in the cloud, the kind of algorithm, the kind of compute capacity that is available to you, the kind of storage that is available to you, uh, what kind of algorithms you can use over there, where you're gonna store the data, what kind of framework can you use, um, all of those would differ really upon your compute capabilities. So the choices of frameworks you know, it really varies very widely across the different compute environments. So what Kubeflow does is it provides sort of a uniform layer on top of Kubernetes across these different compute environments. So if you were to think of a single definition, single line definition, last week we had a Kubeflow summit back in the Bay Area. That's where I am from. And we had Kubeflow Summit. So we were thinking about what is sort of my one-line definition of Kubeflow. So think of Kubeflow as a containerized machine learning platform. It happens to run on Kubernetes, but it really hides all those details from you that is running on Kubernetes. So think of it as a containerized machine learning platform. Okay, That's sort of your one-line definition, and we'll dig into that more and more. So let's talk about what is Kubeflow. Now, you have a Kubernetes cluster installed anywhere. It doesn't matter which cloud, which environment. Doesn't matter absolutely at all. Um, although the examples that I'm going to use here are going to use Amazon EKS. What is Kubeflow? Well, Kubeflow is a containerized machine learning platform, as I said earlier. It consists of a wide variety of components. So it has something for training, something for serving. Um, it has Jupyter Notebook, which is exactly the feedback or the uh, interface that the data scientists are familiar with. Uh, it has uh, hyperparameter tuning. We'll hopefully be able to get into some of these topics. Um, uh, it has um, an ability to be able to manage your experiments. So hopefully we'll be able to show you how do you manage your experiments. And that is an important capability. Like once the data scientist has built like a training experiment, then he want to be able to tune it 
with different parameters, and we want to be able to manage those experiments and rerun those experiments, so that all of that metadata needs to be stored and versioned, so that scientists can go back and forth and then finally say, okay, this model is now tuned. And the optimize is fully optimized, not fully, but is heavily optimized, and the accuracy of the model is 92%. And this is the model that I want to put into production. So basically, this is sort of a mix of what Qflow offers. Uh, if you look a little bit on the training side of it, for example, um, sure, you can run TensorFlow by yourself, but what Qflow comes with is a TensorFlow operator. So now you have a TensorFlow component already installed as part of your Kubernetes, and the lifecycle is managed because of being an operator. Similarly, if you look on the serving side of it, um, sure, you can use TensorFlow serving by yourself, but now this is integrated as part of um, uh, Qflow itself. And there are components in Qflow that gives you that framework agnosticism. So today, sure, I'm using uh, KF serving is the way that you do serving. Um, and the ability to switch from TensorFlow to PyTorch to Selden Core, depending upon what framework you're using, is quite seamless. And that's, that's a huge capability. That's a huge uh, ability to be able to be more effective in machine learning. What is Amazon EKS? Well, Amazon EKS is our managed service, which we announced about two reinvents ago. Um, what Amazon EKS gives you, it gives you a managed Kubernetes control plane in the cloud. Um, so once your cluster is up and running, it gives you a 100% native upstream experience. There is no internal version, no forking, no branching. Uh, today, what you get is a 113 cluster by default, but you can get a 114 cluster for Kubernetes as well. You just have to specify the version. Um, just like any AWS service, it gives you the ability to run your production-grade workloads. We got tons and tons of customers who are using Amazon EKS for their production-grade services, so Snap and GoDaddy and uh, Fidelity. You know, there's a huge range of customers that are using it for a wide range of um, workloads. And of course, it's well integrated with the additional AWS services. So things like CloudWatch and CloudTrail and IAM and all those integrations are available to you. How do you get started with Amazon EKS? So you, the first thing is you want to fire up a Kubernetes cluster. So EKS Cuttle, just like kubectl, the way you manage your Kubernetes cluster, there is EKS Cuttle, the way you manage your Kubernetes or EKS clusters. So you say EKS Cuttle create cluster, and that creates your Kubernetes cluster. So very, very straightforward. It has got reasonable defaults. You can tweak it. The region, the number of nodes, the GPU, and all those capabilities can be very easily tweaked in. But that's sort of the idea, EKS Cuttle. And that's the official CLI, which is integrated as part of our docs as well. Now let's talk about, once you have set up your Kubernetes cluster, you want to think about, how am I going to set up this Kubernetes cluster, particularly from the machine learning perspective? So one of the options that we have seen among our customers is where uh, they create one training cluster. And in that training cluster, in this case, for example, you're seeing they're using P3 instances. And those P3 instances are in an auto-scaling group. What gives that, that gives me the capability for the P3 instances to scale up and down. Okay? Then I have a separate EKS cluster, and that EKS cluster is for inference. Instead of using P3 instances, I'm going to use a P2 instances, which are slightly cheaper, actually. So it depends what you want to do with it. So GPU training and a GPU inference, but they're both set up in their own um, auto-scaling groups. So now, how does the entire flow look like? I got my model, or my data, training data, um, test data, all of that stored in a S3 bucket, for example. I feed it into my training cluster. Training cluster is where I have uh, my application code written, packaged up as, as a Docker image, and then bundled up as a uh, Kubernetes pod and deployed into that Kubernetes cluster, and GPU aware. Okay, all that thing has to happen. So now that pod is going to look at that data, then the training is going to run, then the data scientist is going to find out, oh, cool, this, this looks good. This is the right model. This is optimized. This is accurate or good enough accuracy. And then they export the training model to an S3 bucket. Once the model is there in the S3 bucket, then uh, inference kicks in. That's, again, same logic. Application code written in Python, whatever your favorite language is, packaged up in a container in a pod and deployed in an inference cluster. And then the inference happens. So this pattern is called as a dedicated Kubernetes cluster. 
That's one of the patterns that we have seen where a cluster is dedicated for training and a cluster is dedicated for inference, and that's how the flow works, because these are two separate teams for costing, for tagging, for allocation, for whatever reason, these are two separate clusters. It really depends upon what your environment requires. Another option that we have seen is where you have one cluster, one EKS cluster, one Kubernetes cluster, and in that you have set up two separate auto-scaling groups, or we call as node groups. So now these are two separate node groups here, for example, in this case, I have a node group with three P3 instances and two PT instances on the right side. Now each node in the node group has a tag, and the whole point of that tag is because now when I'm targeting a job at that particular cluster, I can use node selector or node affinity essentially. Same model, you know, I got my S3 bucket, that's where my data is stored. Training happens, train model get exported, comes back, inference happens and a user is happy. And the way I'm deploying the job is by using node affinity in this case. So I'm clearly saying that when you're deploying a training job, use node selector role colon train. And then it goes to that particular node group. That's an important part. Um, this, is, this is called as a unified Kubernetes cluster because this is one cluster with two node groups. A slight variation that we have also seen is um, option 2B, essentially, very similar to 2A, but now I have my apps sitting in the same cluster as well. So I got my training, my inference, and my apps all sitting in the same cluster. In one cluster, I can get fully unified monitoring, all integrated, all three different node groups. I can still target my applications the way I want to do this, and these applications can quickly you know, iterate because they're in the same cluster. Again, different models, different needs, different requirements that we have seen from customers. Uh, once again, when you deploy, you use the node selector pattern, and then you target to a particular auto-scaling group. What kind of auto-scaling groups you use is very important for machine learning workloads. Now, if you think about it, by default, Kubernetes does not come with an autoscaler. And by autoscaler, I mean the node autoscaler. Now, if your, node, uh, if your cluster runs out of capacity, it runs out of capacity. So uh, a common way that customers uh, would look around that problem is they install something called as a cluster autoscaler. And so there is a default cluster autoscaler available. It's basically a Kubernetes manifest, and it watches your node um, utilization and accordingly scales and up and down the cluster. Now, Cluster autoscaler is a default cluster autoscaler that customers install. There is this project called as Escalator, which is by Atlassian. It's an open source project, and that is much more suited. Let's look at the differences between the two. Uh, the cluster autoscaler is meant for burstable workloads. If you think about Kubernetes was originally meant for stateless workloads. It has stateful capabilities as well now, but it was meant for stateless workloads. So, and what that means is I'm going to get a load of requests, the request will spike up, and then it will slow down again. Those are burstable workloads. Um, the escalator one, on the other hand, is meant more for batch and job-based workloads. How does their behavior differ in that case? In the cluster autoscaler, it will assume that all of your jobs are stateless, so at any point of time, I can terminate a pod, and I can move it to a different node, and the application behavior will not change. And it does so because it wants to make sure that your cluster is efficiently and optimally utilized. So it will terminate a pod, move it to a different node, and because the pod will come up over there, and then the node becomes empty, then it will claim the node so that you don't have to pay too much money over there for the cluster utilization. That is not a good model for a batch-based or a ML-based workload because the training algorithm typically runs for a few hours, maybe days in certain cases, or weeks. You don't want it to aggressively terminate your pod or a job. You want the job to be finished, and then you can say, okay, now you can move. So that's sort of the primary difference between the two here. On the cluster autoscaler side, you scale up based upon metrics. You can set up your CPU, memory, applications-based thresholds, all sorts of stuff. And then on the escalator side, it scales up aggressively, actually, as opposed to scaling down. It scales up aggressively. It says, hey, you know what? There's a bad job waiting, and I don't want that ML job to be waiting, so I'm going to scale up the cluster rather quickly and spin up my job over there so that the ML training can run and I can you know, be free with the job. They both, of course, plug into the uh, auto-scaling group of your cluster, and of course, they run. Uh, it can be run in the same cluster. So, for example, I have two different node groups. Like 
one for training, one for inference, and one for maybe application. So I can say, you know what, for this node group, run my escalator, and for this node group, run my cluster autoscaler. And that is, again, a pattern that we have seen among our customers. So let's get into um, Qflow requirements. How do we get started with it? Uh, um, you can really get started with four CPUs, um, 12 gigabyte memory, and 50 GB storage. Um, it really sits on, and that's on top of Kubernetes, essentially. So whatever your Kubernetes needs, uh, it sits on top of that. Um, 0 0.7 was released three, four days ago. Uh, it has been in an RC for a while, uh, was released four days ago. Um, 0 0.7 only works with 114 and 115. None of them work with 116 at this point of time, known bug. But if you could use an older version of Kubeflow, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, they would work with 111 as well. But the current versions are only tested with a more recent version. So if you think about sort of the Kubernetes cadence, uh, every three to four months there is a new release, and then you know, the previous releases, typically three or older releases, is customers are quickly moving on to the newer releases as well. So how do you start with Kubeflow on desktop? Uh, there is a tool called as MiniKF. Um, you can use MiniKF, download it. Um, the, it comes with uh, VirtualBox. It bas it's basically a Vagrant file. So it uses Vagrant and VirtualBox to fire it up. So just like MiniCube is for Kubernetes on your desktop, MiniKF is Kubeflow on your desktop. And it includes MiniCube bundled in. You don't really need anything on top of that. And it really needs just two CPU. And it's a good getting started experience for Kubeflow, essentially. Um, runs on Mac OS, Linux, Windows, so a good variety of platforms over there. And again, the point that I said in the beginning, it's a containerized machine learning platform. It does not require you to have Kubernetes knowledge. That's sort of the vision that we're going with. Uh, David Aronchik, the person who actually created the Kubeflow project, he says the goal, the way we should be looking at Kubeflow is removing the Kubernetes K out of Kubeflow. So making it independent of K. So the customers look at Kubeflow as purely as a machine learning platform with no dependence on Kubeflow and, uh, or, or Kubernetes. That just becomes the implementation detail. How does it work on the cloud? Well, of course, it works on the major cloud providers, so AWS and other clouds as well. Um, how does it work on AWS? Um, on AWS, you can run Kubernetes in two ways. Uh, of course, there is Amazon EKS, which we talked about, or you can fire up your own Kubernetes cluster on AWS as well. Um, you can use COPS, or you can use CloudFormation, Terraform, whatever comes to your mind. A wide variety of customers use all sorts of tools over here. Okay? So let's take a look at it. What is my getting started with Qflow on Amazon EKS experience look like? So what I'm going to show you here is eksworkshop.com slash Qflow. Now, in general, eksworkshop.com is a workshop that we have built for our customers and who want to get started with Kubernetes. And that's a top-level workshop that we share with our customers. And that provides the recommendations and the patterns on how you can get started with Amazon EKS rather quickly. So any kind of workload that you want to run on EKS is what this workshop is about. But what I'm going to focus on is the Qflow module over there. It really talks about how you can get started with Qflow on Amazon EKS. Um, it provides the instructions. This is actually updated, literally updated this morning for 0.70. So it talks about how you can easily install 0.70. Um, you need to set up, uh, you got to download the binaries. Once you download the binary, then you got to have a configuration file. As we talked about, Qflow has a lot of different components, and you can customize which component you want to install, which component you don't want to install. Um, otherwise, by default, it will install all of those components in your environment. You need some tools that are required by EKS. This is a brand new EC2 instance, and that's how it will work. Um, then uh, you set up the configuration file for EKS um, or, or Qflow, actually. Then you apply the configuration file. And the application means it will generate the Kubernetes resources or the manifest of the Kubernetes resources that are going to be created in the cluster. So first, the first step is to really generate the resources or the Kubernetes manifest. And then the second step is to really apply those resources to the cluster. That means those resources are going to be created in the cluster. Okay? And uh, once it is created, literally, 
you have an EKS cluster, you get Kubeflow up and install over there. And now it's going to show you an output like this, where it's saying, okay, I got two nodes. Each node has 32 CPU and four GPU. So that's a pretty decent size cluster, you know, eight GPU, 64 uh, CPU uh, cluster, and you can run a pretty decent training model on this. Most of the time we end up seeing customers doing a single node training, and that seems to work for them, okay? So very simple steps in, in that sense to get it up and running. I do have a cluster running here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you to this terminal here, okay? So I'm going to show you the pods that are running here. Okay, I'm going to say kubectl get pods in the namespace kubeflow. And it shows all my pods are running. They have been running for about two days, 11 hours. And all the pods are running. And uh, none of the pods except these two have had some restarts. But otherwise, they look all pretty healthy. You know, They're all one of one or two of two. So the pods are all looking great. Now, once you have Kubeflow installed on the Amazon EKS cluster, then it comes with a Kubeflow dashboard. And how do you get access to the Kubeflow dashboard? Um, you get the Istio ingress, and this is the Istio ingress that is available to you. And using that endpoint, you have access to your Kubeflow dashboard. So let's take a look at our Kubeflow dashboard now. So this is my Kubeflow dashboard. By default, this is what comes up, okay? Now, in this dashboard, you can see that I can create pipelines, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I can create notebook. This is where I create my Jupyter notebooks. Uh, Kateb is my uh, hyperparameter tuning, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and there are other things as well. But for now, let's say I want to create a new notebook server. So I'll go to notebook servers. I'll say new server. And I'm going to give it a name, DevOx. And let's pick a namespace that is pre-created for us. Um, we're going to give it a higher CPU here so that it runs better, and that's about it, pretty much. Take everything else as default and say launch. So what it's doing is, is basically launching a Jupyter notebook for me in my Qflow installation of EKS cluster. Um, data scientists, they are familiar with Jupyter notebook. Um, coming from PyCharm, coming from IntelliJ, coming from Eclipse, it's a very different world. You know, uh, in there you run it and then you see the visualization somewhere else. But Jupyter Notebook is all seamlessly integrated experience. You run the code, you see the output, the visualization, the data modeling, the graphs, all of that in that Jupyter Notebook itself. So you keep iterating the code over there. And then there are integrations built in from Jupyter Notebook, which allows you to save the code to Git and do that back and forth and the collaboration part of it. Okay, so now uh, my DevOps um, Jupyter Notebook is created. I click on connect. So it's connecting to my Jupyter Notebook. It brings up the notebook for me here. Um, the first interface looks pretty dull, but it's like, what is it doing really? But what I'm doing here is creating a new Python 3 notebook. And this is all running on uh, Amazon uh, Cloud here. So I have a training code here, which is not meant to be read, so don't try to read it. But I'm going to drop this training code. And I'm not a data scientist by any means or any size. Um, this is a code that is written by a data scientist. But what it basically does is it downloads a data model. It downloads um, the test and the training data. It has algorithm to train for that training data. So now all I've done is in my Jupyter Notebook, I drop the code. Typically, this would be done in an interactive manner. And I can say, go run it. Okay. So by running, I mean is it just load the code in the Jupyter Notebook, and it's ready to be executed. So all I need to do here is I'm going to say main, and I'm going to say run. And now you can see the output right here itself from the code. So here is, here is where it's downloading the MNIST, which is a standard database for machine learning, is downloading that data in here, and is doing epochs, which is uh, basically five different iterations. And with each epoch, it's basically reporting what sort of the model accuracy and how much is the loss. So the whole goal of machine learning is to reduce your loss function and uh, increase your um, uh, accuracy of your model. So now that the model is trained, it's about 87% accurate. Typically, uh, depending upon your use case, you would shoot for about 90% accuracy or higher. 
That's the way it works out. So this is sort of the flow of a data scientist. And now um, if I have the Git plugin installed here, I can say, go ahead and save this code in Git. And that's where my entire pipeline could trigger. Oh, the code is saved. Do the review, do the packaging, do the Kubernetes wrapping, and install it into the cluster and ready to roll. Now, in this case, the model is trained, but the model is not exported. So typically what I would do is I would also export the model to an S3 bucket. So that, that's where the model is ready, and now it can be used for inference, essentially. So that's sort of you're getting started with Qflow experience on any, and I'm showing this on EKS. This is exactly the same experience on a wide variety of other Kubernetes clusters as well. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? It provides an easy on-ramp to build, deploy, and train your ML models. So you can easily do that. Uh, you can create shared documents. You can write live code. I've seen customers doing presentation, particularly data scientists doing entire presentations using a Jupyter Notebook itself. Um, it supports a wide variety of programming languages. Uh, so uh, Python, R, Julia, Scala, all sorts of languages. The default one that comes as part of Qflow does not have that many language kernels, but you can additionally install those language kernels. But if you go to, say, JupyterLab, which is a hosted version, then, of course, you have a wide variety of um, kernels over there. So I showed you an example of how do you do training using Jupyter Notebook. Now, you may wonder, I've done the training. What is sort of my next step? Is triggering the pipeline the next step or something else? Now, one of the components in um, Qflow is called as Qflow fairing. Um, so by Qflow fairing, what you can do is you can add a few lines of code, and then you can run your training job locally first, and then remotely in the cloud as well. It is basically a Python SDK to build, train, and deploy your ML models remotely. So using the fairing API in your Jupyter Notebook, essentially you can start writing code. And if you think about the Jupyter Notebook structure, it's got a lot of cells, okay? And each cell is an execution boundary. So in the first cell, you write the code to do the training. Second cell, you execute it. Third cell, then you can write this fairing SDK code, which says, oh, take the code from first cell, package it up into a Docker image. Then the fourth cell could be, oh, now create a Kubernetes manifest and deploy. So it basically gives you the mechanism by which you can write that entire Python code to do the training and also take it into deployment. So you can easily package your ML training jobs. You can trail the ML models in the cloud. And it streamlines that entire process on how you can deploy a trained model in the cloud. So let's take a look at an example here. So this is, um, I'm showing you a code from one of the sample workbooks that we have written over here, or a Jupyter Notebook here. So in this case, for example, let me see where. Oh, here. Yeah. Perfect. OK. So now uh, I'm showing you um, from Qflow, import the fairing module, module. From the fairing module, I'm importing multiple classes over here. I'm defining what the fairing backend is. And this is an integration that AWS has done up into Qflow upstream community. So this is available to anybody. You know, if you are doing using fairing to do AWS backend, and I'm saying, OK, oh, wait, where did I lose my? What happened to the mouse? Oh, yeah. Here. Uh, so I'm specifying what my account ID is, what my region is. In this case, I'm going to upload the Docker image, the one that I'm going to create, into ECR. And I'm specifying the S3 bucket in which my exported model is going to go. And then I keep going on this further. Now I'm setting up the S3 context. Once I set up the S3 context, then again, I've got another class here. And I'm specifying what my input files are, the data set. This requirements.txt is particularly critical, because it's going to take a look at that requirements.txt. And based upon that, it says, oh, your code is basically Python. So on that Python code, I'm going to take an opinionated image. I'm going to take requirements.txt, bundle those requirements into your base image, and then create my, your um, Docker image, essentially. And then finally, I'm going to create a prediction endpoint in this case. So all I'm doing is I'm taking that, again, the trained model. So in this case, as you can see, trained aims model dot dat. That's my uh, trained model. Uh, I'm specifying the Docker registry, and I'm saying go create my endpoint. And essentially, I can start serving what data is available so that now my customers are available. So you can do this end to end using Python SDK. Now there are. This is something that um, when we talk to customers, we realize you know, there is a data scientist and there is a ML engineer or ML engineering team or ML ops team. Um, 
just like dev and ops, there is always like, you know what, no, no, we don't want data scientists to take the model into production. We want to take it into the production. So you do the model part of it, and then we will take over. So that's where there is sort of a back and forth that is fairing really meant for production. Do we want the data scientists to be able to put this into production or provide some tools around fairing, which would simplify that entire experience of taking sort of a Qflow job into production? So that's an important part. Let's talk a little bit about hyperparameter tuning using Katib. And what, what, what are hyperparameters, actually? So if you think about it, hyperparameters are parameters that are external to the model to control the training. Now, these are not the parameters to the model. You know, a parameter to the model would be that I want to find out uh, whether the eyes are closed or open. I want to find out what kind of wrinkles do you have on the forehead. I want to find out, are you smiling, are you frowning? So those are parameters to the model. But these are per hyper parameters. These are parameters before the model. Okay? And these are like, what is my learning rate? You know, if, depending upon the neural network that you are setting up, how many layers of neural network I want to create over there? Then you want to talk about the batch size, that I got millions of records. You know, when I'm doing training at one point of time, what should be my batch size? You know, how many epochs I want to run? So those are or called as hyperparameters. And that hyperparameter tuning is important because you do the training and then you identify what are your right set of hyperparameters, and once you have done the right set of hyperparameters, then maybe you can train on a bigger set of data as well. So that's where these are hyperparameters done before the real training actually. So then multiple training runs are done, and that's where the tuning comes in. So basically you find a set of hyperparameters that optimizes an objective function. You've got to define what your objective function is in terms of training, that in terms of training, what I want to do is I want to just increase the accuracy of the model. And for that accuracy, here are my three different hyperparameters. So I'm going to try different variations of those hyperparameters. And then eventually, I'll get to the point where I have tuned those hyperparameters. Now those hyperparameters are going to be fed to the model. And that's how the training would be done. So what Kartib is, Kartib is a component as part of Hueflow that really enables hyperparameter training. It provides a UI, it drives a, provides a S API, which simplifies that entire experience. It provides a, 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 a way by which you can put that concepts into your manifest itself. So the slides here are really by Richard Liu and Janu. Uh, I attended the Qflow Summit last week, and these slides are really coming from them, essentially. So the way this thing works is, um, it's a very, again, because it's running on top of Kubernetes, so you will see very Kubernetes-centric language here. But essentially, there is an experiment controller. So you create an experiment that, okay, here are the different parameters that I want. The experiment controller really goes to a suggestion controller, because in the experiment you define, here are the three experiments, here are the three different ranges that I care about it. Then it gives one suggestion, you get a suggestion, you create a trial, and you do multiple runs of that trial, and with each trial, essentially, you collect the metrics, which you feed it back into the experiment controller. So the whole idea over here is you have a set of hyperparameters. Those hyperparameters have ranges, which can range. You try different combinations of those ranges, and you feed the metric back into the experiment controller for that objective function. Okay? Now, if I were to show you here in terms of what this would look like, you know, again, in your Kubernetes manifest. So in this case, for example, you're seeing uh, this is an experiment here. And um, uh, the objective here is to maximize the validation accuracy and an additional metrics of accuracy. I want to get to the 99% accuracy in this case. And the way you choose hyperparameters, again, there are different algorithms over there. So in this case, it happens to choose the random algorithm. Now, in terms of the hyperparameters, I'm specifying exactly. So I have a LR, a num layers, and an optimizer. Those are my three different hyperparameters. And here are my ranges that are specified, the min and the max. So essentially, I have a full range of these hyperparameters that are used for tuning um, my thing. Now, this is the output that is created by Katib, for example. So um, I want you to really read it from right to left, essentially. So what I'm showing over here is how these experiments were run 
and what is the accuracy and the validation accuracy that was given by them so essentially your goal as you said as we said earlier is to get to the point 99.99% percentage uh, of accuracy so if you look here you basically are tracking a line that okay i'm trying a atom optimizer three number of layers and my lr is 0.029 and that gives me an accuracy of about maybe 0.95 and 0.95 of validation accuracy. So essentially, as, as you are experimenting with this, this experiment management is very important because now, you know your goal is right over here. So you trace this line and you pick the values corresponding to those hyperparameters. And this whole experiment, the whole experience of being able to manage the experiments and get a visual representation is what exactly what data scientists like about it. Now, once you have your hyperparameters identified, you can actually start integrating it into your real training on a much bigger set of data. Qflow, actually, <clears throat> I'm going to skip this part. Um, got other things that I want to talk about as well. One of the components we talked about was KF serving, for example. Okay, so I'm gonna actually jump to that straight away. Um, KF serving you know, provides um, serverless inferencing as part of Qflow. Um, I can go through, go through the slides at this point of time because I wanna talk about a customer use case, how they are using Qflow. But essentially, KF serving provides a pluggable interface. And by pluggable, what I mean is whether you are using, say, scikit-learn or TensorFlow or PyTorch, this is how your interfaces look like. So in this case, you are serving .qflow.org um, API version here, v1 alpha 1, and you are specifying some metadata. And in the uh, specification, you're saying you want to use scikit-learn. Here's where the model is available. You want to use TensorFlow. Here is the model. And if you want to use PyTorch, here's the model. So it very really gives you that seamless API by which you can switch between these different frameworks very easily. Another core component that customers often end up using is if they have a large model. You know, that means that is not accommodated by a single GPU or like four GPUs or a single compute, um, which is four GPU or eight GPU. Then they get into this concept of call as distributed training using Horoward. And um, distributed could mean distributed compute or it could mean distributed data. So either way, you, know, you could use in any of the ways. Uh, now, Horoward is a project that was created by Uber, and it hosted by um, uh, the AI Foundation, by Linux Foundation, essentially. And um, it gives you a distributed training framework for TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, and Apache MXNet. It works with any of those frameworks, essentially, even though the original intent was to add distributed training to TensorFlow. Now, uh, two main differences. TensorFlow, uh, after Uber created um, Horoward has also added support for distributed TensorFlow support. But two main differences that uh, we have seen, uh, at least you know, in terms of uh, how they compare. First is going from single compute training to multi-GPU, multi-compute training requires code changes. Um, so the number of code changes that are required over here in case of Horoward are much lesser. Um, uh, because you need to initialize the code and you need to make sure that they're distributed and collected back. So those code changes are a lot lesser. And uh, the Horoward website, again, claims that they are two times faster. And the benchmarks are only as much true. So definitely recommend to try it on your own and see what your experience is. Another important component that I want to talk about is Qflow pipelines. Actually, at Qflow Summit, there was a survey, and they were asking, what is the most used component of, across all of Qflow? And Qflow pipelines, apparently, is the most used component, then followed by the Jupyter Notebook. And given time, I might be able to show you some data as well. But what did, what's Qflow pipeline? Qflow pipeline is basically where you compose deploy and manage your end-to-end -end ML workflows. So let's say um, you want to do a training, and then you want to do more training, and then you want to do experiment management. And once you have done all of that, then you want to say, OK, pick up the data from that and take it into production. So you can define your entire pipeline right there itself. 
It gives you that ability to end-to-end -end experimentation, um, and it's a reliable experimentation because it's all happening in the machine learning space. Now, remember, this is primarily suited for the data scientists because they can easily create Qflow pipelines. There are Python SDKs, all of that available for that. So there are um, um, different classes like KFP compiler, KFP, or packages rather, KFP compiler, KFP components, KFP client. And so for example, the KFP compiler one particularly has classes and methods for building Docker containers. So now using that Qflow pipeline, if you don't want to use fairing, for example, using Qflow pipeline components, using those Python calls, you can say, take my code and convert it into a Docker image. Similarly, the KFP components include classes and methods for interacting with other pipeline components. And then there is a KFP client, of course, which allows to run a pipeline and create an experiment. And that experiment management, again, is a big deal for data scientists because once they create a pipeline for each training run, they may have multiple experiments and then they pick, oh, this training run is successful. Now, from the data scientist perspective, you write sort of the Python code over there, but under the hood, it converts it into, uh, it uses Argo. At least today, it's using Argo. And there are discussions already happening in the Qflow community on how this could be more pluggable so that it, there's no strict reliance on Argo. Um, but uh, today, it takes that Python SDK code that you have written and translates that into the Argo resources, essentially. So in terms of the flow, let's see how it looks like. Um, well, you have your, say, my application code over here. Then you use the Qflow pipeline component to create a Docker image out of it. Then you create, it's a bit complex. Uh, that's the way flow it is right now, at least, because it's evolving and it's still 0 0.7, so feedback welcome. But you have an application code, you convert it into a Docker image, and because this is Python, so you convert it into a Python function. Then you annotate that Python function with pipeline that, okay, this is sort of what my pipeline looks like. And then eventually, um, uh, that pipeline, you know, you download the zip file, that Python code gets compiled to a YAML file, which is sort of an Argo descriptor, and then you upload that into the Qflow pipeline's UI, and which is where the pipeline gets executed. So one of the customer use cases I want to talk about, you know, and again, I found this out at the Qflow Summit. So many thanks to Credo, actually, which is a local Belgium company here. Um, and um, they provide consulting services and software to financial institutions. Um, so what they do, um, they, they wanted to basically, I'm, I will have to refer to my speaker notes here, I, may, I want to make sure I call it out clearly. So they want to provide production grade calculations in the European financial industry. Okay, that was their main thing. And they um, want to do a lot of data products live, and data is basically the terminology that they use um, where a, anywhere there is a, a ML environment requirement, okay? Or anywhere there is a, a script containing a data science logic, so a predictive model in Python, data transformation script in SQL, to be executed in Redshift or a prescriptive model in R. That's sort of the terminology that they use for data model. Okay? So they start with the batch, and then once they have done the batch processing part of it, they understand how this needs to be done, then it transforms into the real time. They were already an AWS customer, and uh, the, uh, the strict need, because of being in the financial industry, to be uh, using um, security, top job, and compliance were really important. So the typical modeling context that they were using was um, uh, to use a structured tabular data, um, interpretable modeling techniques, so no deep learning essentially over there, and very hybrid pipelines in, in the sense that um, the different languages and different frameworks could be used, and that's what they meant, really meant by hybrid as opposed to hybrid compute environment. So their requirements were very clear that they got two sets of requirements from the different set of users. The first one was from the data scientists, that they really wanted to be hybrid, integrated, but still cloud-based development environment. So Python, PySpark, R, SQL, all sorts of different languages were being used, and the data scientists were the ones who were version controlling the scripts and the artifacts. On the ML op side, you know, the, that was the second set of requirements where they could build the hybrid pipelines very easily. They were still familiar with the Python code, and that's how they were creating their uh, Qflow pipelines. Uh, but they wanted to have some dashboarding capabilities and audit trail on the runs. And once again, the Qflow pipelines API and the Qflow API in general is what was helpful to them. 
So the way they deployed the architecture is uh, it, they were already using AWS you know, in their environment. Um, so it was not a greenfield project. They were already using Amazon EKS and deploying their images to Amazon ECR. So all they did was they deployed Qflow on top of Amazon EKS and Elastic Stack for dashboarding, essentially. And then they wrote their custom notebook servers over here. Now, this is just one of the use cases that we know of, and there are many other customers who are using Qflow and, in general, running a lot of machine working load, machine learning load workloads on um, uh, Amazon EKS. So I want to basically jump across and get to this slide. If you're thinking about running machine learning for Kubernetes on AWS, there are a lot of points you need to think about. You know, how, do I, how am I going to do my data ingestion, cleaning, tagging, classification? What kind of algorithm am I going to use? Uh, how am I going to set up my environment? You know, how am I going to train and tune the model, hyperparameter tuning and things like that? Uh, how am I going to deploy that model in production and eventually scale and manage that environment in production? From AWS perspective, we provide you a lot of services in each of those ranges that you can uh, easily be successful of. And so essentially focus on what your core competency is and leverage those services. I'm going to leave you with these three links. The first one is eksworkshop.com slash kubeflow, which is the workshop that I was um, talking about. It gives you an ability to do training, inference, and all those capabilities that are already available. The second one is where we have a whole bunch of Jupyter notebooks covering a wide range of Qflow concepts over there. So feel free to refer to them. And then the third link is which I could not talk about is where we introduced, where we ran deep learning performance benchmarks. And we give you the way you can configure your cluster if you want to run a machine learning workload on Amazon EKS. We talk about what CUDA drivers, what kind of frameworks, and how we configured it so that you can replicate that in your own environment. And I know we are out of time, but I am going to be around for the rest of the evening, and let's talk more. Thank you so much.